Okay, the um, title of uh, this talk is called Asteroids, Windows into Fate and Destiny. Now, first of all, let's just clear some of the basic astronomy out of the way. The asteroids are um, thousands of small star-like celestial bodies, real bodies. They are orbiting in the solar system, primarily between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, although there are some that are called orbit crossers that go from inside this belt, crossing the orbits of um, Venus and Mercury and closer to the sun, such as Icarus. They have, for the most part, four-year orbits. So their positions in individual charts are um, relatively personal. And that they were, first of them was discovered on New Year's Eve of 1800. And I was telling the story to someone that um, it was an Italian astronomer Father Giuseppe Piazzi, who was not searching for the asteroids but correcting errors in the star catalog, that found the first one. And because his observatory was on Venetian Plains, which was in mythology the site where Pluto was said to have abducted um, Persephone, he named this first asteroid Ceres, which is the Latin version of Demeter in honor of the local goddess of his native land. And that set the precedent for the next few asteroids discovered in the following years to be named after other of the great goddesses of Greek mythology, Pallas Athena and Juno and Vesta. And by the end of the century, there had been a 1,000 asteroids that had been discovered. And most of them were named after uh, goddesses from many of the different mythological traditions, not only the Greco-Roman, but the ancient Near East from India, the Norse and Celtic mythology, the Egyptian, and so on. And the question co often comes up is, well, how did the asteroids get their names? And the answer is that the astronomer that discovers the asteroid has the privilege of naming it. So when they began to run out of feminine goddesses, um, astronomers were taking more uh, liberality with their decisions. So they began giving them the names after gods from the different traditions, and also naming them after their wife or their mother or their son. So there's many asteroids that have <coughs> John and Nancy and Mary and Joseph and Richard. And then asteroids would also be named after geographic places, such as Paris and Berkeley and Russia and Africa, and also after concepts, such as karma and lust and compassion um, and beer and, <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, we have um, over 12,000 named and numbered asteroids for which there exist ephemerides. So this, um, as of July, is the latest listing. And I'm going to pass it around so you could look at it. And I encourage you to see if your first or last name is on it. Because then you can order an ephemeris for that asteroid. And there's also websites out there where you could just put in your name, Asteroid, and find out where you are in every other chart that you do, how you fall on someone else's chart. But what gets even more interesting is if you get your own list of 12,000, which is simple enough to do, then whenever you meet someone, you can find if their name is on that list and put it in your chart. And if you're obsessed now, it's nothing <laughs> of what the asteroids have in store for you. <laughs> okay. Um.
I just wanted to say that while the first asteroid was discovered in 1800, the first ephemeris was not um, available until 1973. And that was due to the efforts of Eleanor Bach from New York, who pleaded with astronomers to calculate these highly eccentric orbits. And this was before the computer age. So she got that done. And now, thanks to the work of Mark Pottinger, who's the son of Zip Dobbins, he has um, incorporated the uh, formulas so that all of the other asteroids can exist as astrological software. And his company is CCRS. Um, also, I understand Kepler software has the availability of um, working those into your programs. So when um, I was uh, first got connected with the asteroids in 1973, uh, within two years of my studies of astrology, and I was at my first astrological conference um, not knowing anyone, um, dressed up in all of my flower child hippie finest, <laughs> walking into a place where all the other women were wearing like suits and high heels and <laughs> fingernails and feeling like really like my Leo rising said, oh no, I'm not dressed for this occasion. But there was this really nice lady standing off to the side of me and I kind of sidled up next to her so it wouldn't look like I was all by myself. And that turned out to be Eleanor Bach, where they um, had a satchel with the brand new published ephemerises. And uh, after some conversation, she gave me a copy of the book. So that's when I began to use the astrologers. And my understanding of the asteroids has grown up at the same time and level as that of the planets. But what I was going to say was that when I was a young astrologer, I believed very much in free will and that this chart showed us our range of the choices that were available for us to make. But now, 35 years later of looking at charts, um, I am much more fate-oriented. And my experience has shown me that our lives are way more fated than anyone would be comfortable in possibly um, accepting or imagining, and that it is not my studies in traditional astrology that have brought me to this conclusion, but rather my work with the asteroids. Hence the title of this talk, Windows into Fate and Destiny. Um, I'm going to take about um, uh, maybe uh, 10 minutes or less and do just a little bit of ancient philosophy. These days, you can hardly get me to give any kind of talk without interjecting some kind of historical or philosophical con context. And I want to set the stage for then being able to look at quite a few charts where I've included the asteroids. And in um, around 2000, um, Robert Schmidt, as some of you know from Project Hindsight, when um, one of his associates was dissing the asteroids, as like more cosmic rubble as astrologers have over the last couple of decades. You know, it, like I got all, all riled up and I was going to visit Hindsight at that time, so I prepared the list of 12,000 for Bob and his wife Ellen. And when I pointed out to Bob that the asteroid Schmidt, his own name asteroid, was conjunct in his chart, the asteroid Plato, who is his favorite philosopher, and exactly opposite to the degree was the asteroid Philosophia, the goddess of philosophy, conjunct the asteroid Schelling, his second favorite philosopher. <laughs> Bob said to me um, that if I could uh, create um, uh, an argument showing how the asteroids might fit into the cosmology of the ancient world, then he would consider enfolding the asteroids into the um, Hellenistic astrology model that he's been developing. So that was my challenge. And um, I spent a year doing that and then presented that talk at UAC 
in uh, 2001 or 2002, I forget which year. Um, but what I'm going to give you now is like a five-minute distillation of that. The, um, and Bob had suggested that if I um, looked at the Greek philosophical concept of the daimon, which Kim mentioned yesterday, that that might lead me on a fruitful track. Now, the um, concept of the daimon appears in the earliest of the ancient Greek literature in Homer, who was the first writer. And um, Homer described the daimons as an anonymous driving force that compelled people to certain actions. An anonymous driving force that compelled people to certain actions. And in Greek, the uh, word daimonius, which is the adjective form of this, meant something that was uncanny or incomprehensible. And so the daimon came to be connected with the notion of fate. And in Greek, the word for fate is moira, which means a lot or an allotted portion in life. What is one's due portion? And um, there was the phrase that came about, it is allotted by fate. So the next Greek writer, Hesiod, um, in his work, The Theogony, which is the birth and generation of the gods, uh, personalize this concept of Moira into the three fates, okay? And they were called um, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, who spun and measured and cut the thread of life. And they came to be understood as the spinners and weavers of a person's destiny that appeared at birth and that no god, not even Zeus, could override the decrees of the three fates. Now, it was um, Plato um, who expanded upon this notion of the daimon and of the fates in many of his works. But the one that I want to um, share with you in particular comes from his work called The Republic, which is his notion of the ideal state. And in the very last chapter, there's this interesting sequence called the myth of air, E-R. And Plato was 17 years old when we have the first um, Babylonian horoscope in 409 BC. And so that there's a question of like, what did the Greeks know about astrology? We know that they were, certainly weren't practicing it. But this piece in Plato, well, I won't make my comment until I tell you how it goes. He's talking about this person called Air, who comes from um, Asia Minor. And Air is on the extreme edges of the cosmos, where all of the souls who are waiting to be born are lined up, um, waiting to choose their lives. And this place on the edge of the cosmos is between uh, the heavens and Tartarus, which is the underworld. And there is a spindle around um, that is sitting on the lap of necessity, the goddess necessity. And around the spindle are seven planetary worlds, or seven planetary orbits. And on each of the planetary orbits sits a siren who are all singing in tune the tone of cosmic harmony. And then at three equidistant places are additional seats upon which sit the three fates, okay, who are singing of the things that have been in the past, that are in the present, and that will be in the future. Now, each of the souls standing there have to take lots, which like numbers, like when you go to the DVD to renew your license, you have to like take a number, sit down and wait your turn. And then in the order of their lots, they're called up to look out over the choice of lives that are available. And they have the free will to choose their lives. 
And depending upon their level of savviness, they may look at a life that seems like really great on the surface, but actually it's quite difficult. Or there might be a life that looks challenging on the surface, but it ends up quite well. But it's up to them to make figure that out. And next to each life is attached a daimon. And so they have the free will to pick a life. And when they do, that daimon comes in, stands next to them, and leads them to the three fates. And then Lachesis spins the planetary orbits, which ratifies the life and the fate that the person has chosen. And then they're brought to Atropos, who makes it irreversible. The soul is then sent to the Earth, accompanied by the daimon, to ensure that that life is lived exactly as it has been decreed by the fates. Okay. Now, the astrological symbolism here is quite phenomenal in the work of Plato. And the statement that he is making is that while we might have the free will to choose our lives, once we've made that choice, then we are bound to live it out as the um, spindle, the thread on the spindle, is slowly unraveled. Now, in other works of Plato's, um, he uh, gave more characteristics of the daimons. And um, there were uh, and other writers as well. And they said that there were like thousands and thousands of daimons populating the heavens, that they were semi-divine spirits, part human, part mortal, um, not as like divine as the gods, but definitely more so than humans, and that um, they were invisible, and that they acted as messengers, carrying messages from humans to the gods, from gods to humans, and they also accompanied a person at their moment of death to the underworld, to their place of judgment, and reaccompany the person back into life. And that they were agents of the gods. And later in the um, Hermetic literature, they were agents of the planetary gods who enforced the degrees of the gods and attended to the details that the gods simply didn't want to be bothered with. Now, in terms of the asteroids, there are thousands of them. And they're invisible, that they're really tiny, like the diamonds were, that they're seemingly insignificant unless they are attached to one of the planetary gods. And this is how I determine their significance in the chart as to which points they are attached to. So in this longer lecture, um, I have made a case uh, for the asteroids being correlated to the Greek notion of the daimons. But what I want to do here is simply um, kind of give you the quick run of that and then start looking at the charts themselves. So the way that I work with the asteroids is that you see this list of 12,000 going around. In Mark's program, um, there's the capacity to um, make custom lists. So I went through that list shows about 500 that I'm particularly interested in. And that was a combination of many of the mythic ones, of a splattering of personal names, of um, a number of the concepts in geographical places. But when I do um, a chart for presentation, I'll run the list of 12,000, which can be arranged either in a zodiacal sort, so you can see what's conjunct, the sun, moon, the angles, or an alphabetical sort, so if you're looking for particular names and places, it's really easy. Um, so I have the list of the 500 zodiacally sorted. And I take that in my chart. And I go through the list, starting with Aries. And then I pull out the asteroids that I think are most important. There's a handful of maybe 10 or so that I use for everyone's chart. And the others are unique to each chart. Now, what makes an asteroid important 
on the first tier is if they are connected to the two luminaries, the sun or moon, by conjunction or opposition. And I'm using, except for Ceres, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta, very small orbs, like about three, no more than three degree orbs, one, two, three at the most. Um, and if they are connected to the ascendant or the midheaven, or to the other, secondarily to the other two angles, and if they are connected to the ruler of the ascendant. And that's my first tier that I'm looking at. But if I start placing, and if I happen to know that their own name is on this list, then I'll look for that name. Or if I know them and I know that their partner's name is on the list or their children's name, I'll look for those names and put those in as well. And then when I see a theme beginning to emerge, like let's say one of the oracular goddesses, like Pythia, is on the ascendant, and maybe something like Delphi, the place where she practices on the moon, then I'm thinking, hey, maybe I have a theme going here, so I'll look for all of the other asteroids that fall into that family and put them in to see if I have a larger pattern. And that's one of the reasons I created that list for you of trying to group them together in families so you can, uh, if you're inspired to do this, do that kind of work. And then um, the chart is ready. And um, I begin to read it. Okay. So uh, with that, I'm going to share um, some of the charts of famous people that I've been doing over the years from my files just to show you how they work. But before I go there, I wonder if there are any questions on technique or anything that I've said so far. Yes. Of asteroids, and you're saying there's one place like I'm called Mark, so I could have Mark the asteroid in my chart. You have is the that, asteroid what? Mark? Yeah, yeah, say, for example. Yeah. Is, is that the degree that Mark was discovered? Because no. surely Mark's moving. What, what fixes At your that birth, point? the ah. asteroid Mark was at that position. And that list shows all of that? No, this list just shows the names themselves. Right. And they have numbers with them. That was the order of their discovery. Okay. But if you put your birth data into an asteroid program, it will generate the positions for any particular moment. Are, yes, Julie. What other programs, uh, are there other programs besides Kepler and the And the one? Mark Pottinger CCRS are the two that I know about. And Mark's, I think, is, well, I've always been using it. I haven't used the Kepler software. But there are places on the internet where you can simply put in the name of the asteroid and a particular date, and it will give you the position. And if you go to the Astrodynst website, that will give you links to the asteroid ephemeris. OK, yes, Maurice. If you don't have the exact name, but you have a name of the same family, do you use that? Yes, Jacob Schwartz, who has done a lot of work with asteroids, shows one. Names that sound like the name you're looking at work, or names that are the version of the name in another language work as well. Okay, and you'll see some of the ways I've uh, manipul I've worked with that principle. Okay, are we ready to start? One, and in your handout, I've given you the charts for um, Brad and Angelina. Uh, but I'm going to be showing you a number of other charts before we get to these. And this is the chart of uh, Prince Charles of Wales, um, November 14, 1948, 9.14 PM in London. And some of you, his story is fairly well known of his marriage to um, Princess Diana, of her um, tragically early death, and of his lifelong love, Camilla Parker Bowles, to whom he's now married. And if we look at um, Charles's chart, we see that his planet v L Venus is at 16 degrees of Libra. 
and conjunct Venus within 15 minutes of arc are the asteroids Camilla and the asteroid Parks. <laughs> okay. So from the moment of his birth, enfolded into the symbolism of Venus, was the name of the woman with whom he had a lifelong love. And so once you see this, like you can't fault him <laughs> for the choices he's made. Okay. On either side of these um, is the asteroid Cupido for Cupid the mischievous god of love, and the asteroid Aphrodite, who was the mother of Cupid. Okay. Okay, so, like, if that's not, like, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, we have, um, uh, there's a second asteroid, Camilla, on the list that has a slightly variant spelling, and that's um, a 21 Virgo, and at 18 Virgo is the asteroid Charlene, which is a version of Charles. So their two names are together. And with them is the asteroid Asmodeus, the Persian demon god of lust, and the asteroid Pecker. <laughs> okay. Now don't laugh about Pecker, <laughs> because Pecker was the main asteroid in the famous Bobbitt castration event. And there, a little diversion here. There in the skies, um, there was a T-square between Venus and Mars and Saturn. And conjunct the, the planet Venus was the asteroid um, Lorraine for Lorena Bobbitt. Conjunct the asteroid Mars was, the planet Mars was the asteroid Johan for John, for John Bobbitt, and conjunct the asteroid Saturn, the, the planet Saturn was the asteroid Pecker. And in Greek mythology, Saturn castrated his father Uranus. Okay. Okay. Now back to Charles's chart. <laughs> We might wonder, um, well, where's Diana in his chart? And Diana is at um, 5 Sag in his fifth house, connected with the asteroid Proserpina, which is the Greek name for the goddess Persephone, who was abducted as a young maiden by the god Pluto. Okay. Diana's in his fifth house his house of children, and Diana was the mother of his children. Now, if we look at what was going on with the asteroid Diana at key points in um, their life together, at their marriage, the asteroid transiting Diana was at three degrees of Leo with an orb of Charles's ascendant. On the day that their divorce became legal, transiting Diana was at 16 Aquarius, exact partile opposite Pluto, at 16 Leo. And at the time of Diana's death, transiting Pluto was conjunct Diana and Proserpina. Now, I want you to remember the degree of Charles's Libra, uh, Venus, which is 16 degrees of Libra. Okay. And next, let's take a look at the chart of Princess Diana. And look to see if she has anything conjunct uh, Venus in Charles's chart. And at 14 Libra, she has the asteroid Charlois, which is the French name for Charles. Okay? So that shows that she had a marriage with someone you know, named Charles. But if we look at 16 Aries, exactly opposite, we find the asteroid Camilla. 
And so in her chart, at the moment of her birth, her in the center, she was torn asunder by Charles and Camilla. Now, you may remember in um, her eulogy after her death, her, when her brother said that, like her namesake, Diana, the goddess of the hunt, she was perhaps the most hunted woman in the world. And the Roman Diana is equivalent to the Greek Artemis. And the asteroid Artemis is conjunct her son. Okay. Now, we might wonder, well, where's the asteroid Diana in her chart, her own name? And that's at 15 degrees of Scorpio. And exactly conjunct it is the asteroid Paris, the scene of her death. And at the date of her death, transit the asteroid Karma Transiting karma was passing over Diana and Paris. <laughs> so let's just take a quick look at the chart of Camilla herself. And right on her ascendant, which is at 4 Leo, of the asteroids um, Charwa for Charles and Parks for her name. So once again, she has the connection of the two names with the asteroid Fama, which means fame, but in Latin means uh, scandal, rumor, uh, and so on. And their relationship has like, you know, subsidized all of the tabloids in England. Uh, and in her chart, the asteroid Moira, as goddess of fate, is conjunct the asteroid Paris. OK, there's more, but we have other charts to look at. Okay. Okay. I think um, we'll do a quick look at our former president, Bill Clinton. And I did a whole lecture on that um, right after the big events having to do with um, uh, Paula Jones and Monica Lewinsky. And um, Clinton has his uh, moon at 20 degrees of Taurus. And conjunct his moon um, at 21 Taurus is the asteroid Bacchus. Okay. Okay. Bacchus was the god of women's ecstasy. Okay. What? Yeah. yeah. In the eighth house. <laughs> okay. And opposite his um, moon is a grouping of four asteroids. One of them is the asteroid Paula, for Paula Jones. Right next to Paula is the asteroid Monica for Monica Lewinsky. Then we have Asmodeus. We saw that in Charles's chart. Asmodeus is the Persian demon god of lust. And then finally, we have his own um, name, William, that are all together. Now, um, Hillary is right exactly conjunct as I see. And she's his rock and anchor. And he has um, an interesting T-square between Pecker <laughs> at 15 Capricorn and Moira, the goddess of fate, at 15 Cancer, and the asteroid Jones for Paula Jones at 13 degrees of Aries. Okay, there's more, but we have other charts to get through. <laughs> okay, um, I want to spend um, a little bit of time with the um, Kennedy family. And in um, 
my work in um, Hellenistic astrology, um, when the certification course comes into place, everyone will be asked to take one famous dead person and to take all of the methods of Hellenistic astrology and apply it to that chart and develop a series of astrological biographies. So in thinking of like whom I wanted to do, I was looking for one, a woman, and two, I was looking for someone that everyone knew about um, because it's, for me it's like sometimes really boring when speakers are up here talking about charts of sort of famous people that you don't know who they are or what they've done. And someone who people still have a lot of curiosity about. So um, I landed on the chart of Jackie Kennedy Onassis, who's a Leo like myself. And uh, this is the chart I've been developing um, with all of the Hellenistic techniques. But I also thought that it would be appropriate to put some of the asteroids in there as well. So in her chart, um, if we look at the moon, which is at 25 Aries, uh, in Hellenistic astrology, the moon is one of the uh, significators of legal marriage. And connected with her moon is the goddess Abundantia, the goddess of abundance, and the asteroid Goldfinger. Okay. And part of Jackie's um, background was that she was born into a wealthy family in the Hamptons of um, eastern Long Island. But because of the stock market crash, the family lost a lot of their money. And then her father was like a gambler and a drinker. And he squandered huge amounts of the family assets. And her mother divorced him, and she married a very wealthy man. But uh, Jackie's stepfather, while he provided trust for his own children, for Jackie and her sister, there were no trusts. So her mother had said to her, she said, if you want to continue living in this lifestyle in which you've grown up, you've got to marry for money. We see this by Saturn in her second house. She always had an incredible fear of financial poverty. And um, so with Jackie's moon, significator of marriage, looking for gold and abundance, Exactly opposite, her moon is at 25 Le Aries, at 24 Libra is the asteroid John, the name of her first husband, and at 26 Libra is the asteroid Aristotle, the name of her second husband. Okay. Not that either of these men made her happy but that she did um, benefit substantially financially through the marriage. Now, a few other interesting things is, you see the asteroid Vesta here at six degrees of Cancer? And in um, Roman mythology, Vesta was the deity of the Vestal Virgins. And their most important function was tending the sacred flame and never allowing it to go out because it was thought to ensure the safety of the um, Roman Empire. And um, when JFK was buried at Arlington Cemetery, that's what Jackie had put on his grave, was the eternal, the flame that was eternally burning. And so conjunct Vesta is the asteroid Washingtonia, where the Arlington Seminary is, Cemetery is, and the um, asteroid uh, Karma, and Kennedy. Okay. Okay. Now, the um, asteroids also, I haven't done very many mythic asteroids here, but they're also quite interesting. And then looking to find like what were some interesting mythic motifs in Jackie's chart, conjuncture sun is, are two asteroids that could be anywhere in the chart, but they happen to be conjunct. And they are Penelope and Odysseus. Okay? Do any of you remember the book The Odyssey that Homer wrote, which told of his, after he left the Trojan War, he traveled all over the Mediterranean trying to get back to his home island of Ithaca, where um, 
his uh, wife, Penelope, was waiting for him, weaving these tapestries and rejecting potential suitors. And so I was, you know, wondering, like, how did this motif of Penelope and Odysseus manifest in Jackie's chart? And you may remember that after she married um, Aristotle Onassis, uh, to, because she was uh, terrified for the lives of her children following the death, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, he took her away to his own Greek island, which was Scorpios. And it's only incidental that she has Scorpio rising. But that Scorpios is in eyesight of the island of Ithaca. Okay. So she has this mythic motif, and she marries a sailor like Odysseus. Aristotle is a huge shipping magnet. And he brings her to right next to the island of Ithaca in order to live. So we might want to, and I like doing these family charts because interesting things happen in terms of both the synastry and family patterns. And so we'll look at JFK's chart for a moment. And in... Um, Hellenistic astrology, um, one of the significations of the seventh house is of death. And the reason for that is that the descendant signifies the place where the sun sets. And it was the image of the sun setting from the horizon into the underworld that gave the association of the sun going into the underworld beneath the horizon. And it was said that the... Um, uh, kingdoms of death were on the far western edges of the ocean. Uh, they also had death in the eighth house, but death was one of the meanings of the seventh house. And JFK has um, 20 degrees of Aries on the descendant, and the asteroid Dallas is at 20 Aries, the place of his own death, bounded by Fitzgerald, Kennedy, and Washingtonia. Now, one might wonder, because we know of his, like, many affairs, uh, where the asteroid Jackie was in his chart. Well, it turns out it's in the fifth house, same place where Prince Charles had Diana, because this was the mother. Okay? And, in fact, it was connected with Rosa, the name of his own mother, Rose. Okay. And one of his famous affairs was with Marilyn Monroe. Okay. And you may all remember Marilyn singing, well, some of you don't remember, but some of you do, Marilyn singing happy birthday to him. And the asteroid Marilyn is at two degrees of Leo, exactly conjunct his Neptune, okay, the ultimate fantasy, and opposite his own name asteroid John. Now, what about Marilyn? <laughs> well, her name, the, uh, Marilyn at 11 Gemini, is exactly conjunct the sun at 10 Gemini. But we know that Marilyn wasn't her real name. It was a stage name. And her real name was Norma Jean Baker. Well. Asteroid Norma is right on the midheaven. The asteroid Jean is also conjunct her son. And is there any connection between the asteroid John and the asteroid, what is this? Lust. <laughs> of course, Pecker is with her moon. And she was like, every guy's like ultimate wet dream. And her last name, Monroe, at 22 Aquarius, 
was opposite both Kennedy and Fitzgerald, and the asteroid Miller for Arthur Miller, the name of her, um, one of her husbands. So what are we beginning to see here, aside from <laughs> laughing a lot? <laughs> that the people and places with whom we have like major connections are already imprinted into our soul's code from the moment of our birth. Now, here's a chart. Um, also within the um, Kennedy family motif that is of the um, uh, plane crash for JFK Jr. And this is where we see um, a combination of the mythological asteroids describing the situation. And as we you know, understand it, that he and his wife, um, Caroline Bassett, were going to a wedding on, from New York to Martha's Vineyard. And he had been taking flying lessons and decided that he would um, fly them. And they got to the airport like late in the day. And uh, some of the more experienced pilots were saying, this is like really bad weather on account of visibility. Uh, but JFK Jr., he was young, he was relatively inexperienced, um, and he had to get like to this wedding on time, and he was by golly going to fly. And despite the warnings, he took off. And we all know of their tragic um, plane crash off the waters. Um, so this is the chart of the um, takeoff time. And we have 28 Capricorn rising. Of course, Neptune at 3 Aquarius is within orb of the ascendant, and that gives the general sense of, you know, the ocean as one of the things we associate with Neptune. But specifically, the asteroid Oceana is at 25 Capricorn, and at 29 Cap is Anubis, which was, comes from the Egyptian mythology as the dog of the underworld who carried the souls down under. Okay. Now, the ruler of the ascendant is Saturn. And Saturn is placed in the um, third house, which is the house of transportation. And so we might say, oh yeah, there's a, a plane, that, that, you know, that there might be some kind of obstacle there. But Saturn is exactly conjunct the asteroid Icarus. Do any of you remember the mythological story of Icarus? Right, Icarus was a youth imprisoned on the island of Crete with his father Daedalus, who was an inventor. And this is where like the Minotaur was. And the only way, they couldn't escape by land or by sea, but the father was an inventor and he gathered together the feathers of all of the birds that flew over the island and fashion them together into two sets of wings uh, held together with melted wax. And when all was ready, he instructed his young and inexperienced son in the art of flight. And he said, whatever you do, don't fly too close to the sun or too low to the water, but follow the middle track. The implication being the heat of the sun would melt the wax, holding the wings together, or the spray from the ocean would clog the plumes and make them too heavy to support flight. At first, Icarus was like terrified, but he made the leap. And once he was up in the air and realized he was free, he was like so excited and also the phenomena of flying that he forgot his father's warning. He went higher and higher toward the sun. The sun melted the wax, and he crashed into the sea, which is now known as the Icarian Sea. So we have the mythological story of the inexperienced youth taking flight who fails to ignore the warnings of those more knowledgeable, which results in the crash landing. And Icarus is right here with the asteroid Moira, the goddess of fate, 
and Saturn, the ruler of the ascendant, and in an exact trine with the moon and Daedalus, the father's name. Okay, right up here at the very top of the chart, we have um, the conjunction of the asteroid John at zero Sag and Kennedy at two Sag with Pluto and the black moon Lilith that Liz spoke to you about yesterday. So there in the event chart, we see how the asteroids are working both in name ways and in mythic motif ways. Okay. Any, like, questions? Yeah. I was wondering with an uh, asteroid like Icarus looking in the charts as you've done over the years, do you mm -hmm. find that when it's conjunct uh, these major points in the first tier that there's always some kind of very karmic unpleasant outcome? Like no. There, actually, the question, oh, you have the question. No, Icarus doesn't always mean a plane crash, but from a psychological perspective, um, when Icarus is a strong archetype, um, I often see people who um, love to fly through the air fast as motorcycle riders, as sky jumpers, as aviators, as skiers, right. And what it means is a strong desire for liberation, whether that liberation is physical or from socially conditioned situations, or even spiritual liberation, because many meditators have Icarus as well. And for the need in all of those to follow the middle path, okay? Like when you're on the motorcycle, you have this really powerful, rapidly moving vehicle. And unless you're totally mindful and focused, there's the possibility of crash landing. Well, the same thing in meditation. They say if you're doing advanced forms of meditation and you're not under the guidance of a teacher who is regulating it, the possibility is just like blowing your mind out. So um, these are some of the ways in which you can take the mythic theme and apply it to individual circumstances. Okay, yes, in the back. charts, birth charts, even the ones that show Diana's death? Are all of them birth charts, even the ones that show what? All the charts that you showed us, are they all birth charts? Yes, these are all birth charts. Well, if, they're all birth charts then can you look at someone's chart and see when they're going to die? Or no. I mean, what would you look at to see their death? Mm -hmm. So we, didn't, we know that Diana had some kind of connection with Paris. We didn't know that it was necessarily death. But at the moment of her death, the as transiting asteroid karma was conjoined it. So one might say that some kind of karmic event would occur for her at Paris at that time. But whether or not it was death could not necessarily be told. Yes, Maurice. Really fascinating, but Scorpio Mercury has <laughs> doubting mind sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was also exploring the fact that we have 360 degrees mm -hmm. and 12,000 asteroids. Yes. So you have about 300 asteroids per degree, mm -hmm. which can easily lead to having always something somewhere. Always something somewhere. This is true, but it's what happens to be where. Yes. That becomes interesting. That's definitely interesting to the light of the example. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so then um, let's look at the charts of um, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Baby Shiloh. And 
Of the list of asteroids, um, I didn't do like a totally exhaustive thing, but what I have here are ones that were names that seemed to be relevant to what was going on at the time and also what little I knew. To really get into it, one would do like a close biography and find the names and motifs of the whole life. Um, but what we have, um, for starters, is that the asteroid Angelina, which of course I would put in here because it's her own name, is at 5 Virgo, and it's conjunct the asteroid Lilith. Okay? Many of you have been studying Lilith, and Lilith is the image of the uh, femme fatale who is very sexually magnetic and alluring to men, but is also um, historically was demonized into um, the goddess who um, aroused men in their dreams at night and captured their nocturnal emissions and turned their seed into demons. And so that there's a tremendous fear of the sexual power of women along with the sexual allure. And we can see how Angelina, in many of the roles that she's played, has certainly embodied the archetype of Lilith. Okay. But it's not really doing much in her chart, per se. But remember that when we look at Brad's chart, we'll see what the connection is. Then um, she. Um, conjunct her moon is the asteroid Pittock, which was the closest I could come to Brad Pitt. Okay? So just hold that in mind. And the asteroid Bradley at 13 Aquarius is exactly conjunct trine her sun. That's sort of okay, but I mean, it's kind of a good hit, but it's not astounding. But what is very interesting is Right on her midheaven at 17 Aries is the asteroid Namibia, okay. conjunct the asteroid Demeter, who was the mother goddess and the goddess of grain and of agriculture and of feeding the people. So that when she went to give birth to her child, she went specifically to this country in Africa and at the midheaven, everyone in the world knew about it. Okay, it came into full prominence. And then another thing I want to point out is connected with the uh, part of fortune are the asteroids um, Asclepius, who's a god of healing, and um, Educatio, which has to do with education. Okay, so we're going to simply. Um, note some of these things right now, and then briefly look at Brad's chart, and then put these together. Oh, this is pretty shy, though. Now, Brett has a son at 25 Sag, and what asteroid is conjunct his son is Lilith. Okay? So, tied up into um, when one of the ways in when feminine planets or asteroids are configured in men's charts, the men either can express that quality themselves if they're very integrated. But usually, how it happens is that they project it onto the significant women in their lives. And so then, um, Angelina, whose name embodies the Lilith archetype, um, becomes an appropriate hook for the projections of Brad's son Lilith conjunction. And um, if uh, some of you saw Mr. and Mrs. Smith, okay, like she was a great Lilith in that movie. Remember in the opening scene where she dresses up in all of that black leather and like 
you know, kills the guy as a hit woman. Uh, and the asteroid Smith is at a 23 Sag. <laughs> I thought that would be interesting to put in their charts. It's right there where they got together. And Brad also has the asteroid Namibia conjunct his sun. So he also has very important faded karmic connection with that particular place. Okay. And conjunct his asteroid, his ascendant is the asteroid Lust. And I mean, there are all these women who are like totally <laughs> enamored of looking at him on screen. Now, it's interesting to see um, in their charts that um, Uh, Angelina has um, her ascendant at 28 Cancer, conjunct Venus, which places her descendant at 28 Capricorn. Okay? The descendant is the point of relationship. So in Brad's chart, he has the moon and Venus at 22, 23 Cap, falling on her descendant opposite her Venus. Yeah, 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 that's like classic synastry. But at 28 Capricorn, right on her descendant, is the asteroid Angelina. And furthermore, at 28 Capricorn, is the asteroid Pitic. And so the combination of Angelina Pitic as his woman falls in his chart with an orb of his Venus but exactly on the degree of her descendant. Um, and then, what asteroid is opposite Angelina? My goodness, it is the asteroid Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, Brad's in the middle, <laughs> and he's pulled apart by... <laughs> Jennifer and Angelina. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the um, sinistry in their charts. Okay. And I already mentioned that um, Angelina's descendant is conjunct Brad's Angelina Pittick conjunction. Then in Angelina's chart, she has the asteroid Karma at 22 degrees of Cancer. Well, that is exactly opposite Brad's moon at 22 Capricorn. Okay. Uh, she has the asteroid Moira, the goddess of fate, at 22 Sag, and in Brad's chart, at 21, Sag is Namibia. 22, Sag is Vesta. 25, Sag is his son. And 23, Sag is the asteroid Smith. Okay. And then they have uh, Angelina Ceres, which is the child birthing asteroid, conjunct Brad's Moira, the goddess of fate. So they have fate and having this child. And then Angelina's connection of educatio for education and Asclepius for healing is conjunct Brad's asteroid Africa. And what they have now done is donated like over a million dollars to uh, nations in Africa that have to do with the health and education of the children. So good. So, how does baby Shiloh figure into this? Well, the first thing that struck me was that when she was born, like 29 Pisces was rising, okay? Which means 29 Virgo was setting. And right at 29 Virgo is the asteroid 
Angelina, her mother's name. Okay. So just as the asteroid Angelina was setting at the descendant, baby Shiloh was born. Okay. Um, with her name, her son is conjunct the asteroid Pittman, so her dad's name is with her son. And Jupiter, using traditional rulerships, which I do, Jupiter is the um, ruler of the ascendant, which places it up here in Scorpio, 11 Scorpio, and at 12 Scorpio is the asteroid Jolie, her mother's name. Okay, so father's name with the son, mother's name with ascendant ruler. And the name Shiloh is um, a word um, from the ancient Israelites meaning um, peace, and the asteroid Pax, which is the Roman name for peace, is connected with Jupiter, the ascendant ruler. Okay, so she was named appropriately from the appropriate parents. So um, Shiloh's asteroid Karma is um, conjunct Brad's moon, okay, to the degree, okay, Shiloh's Asteroid um, Africa is conjunct Brad's Jupiter. Shiloh has um, Jupiter and Africa opposite Angelina's series for her mother. And Shiloh has um, her Mars conjunct Angelina's karma. Okay, so there we have it in terms of the... Um, uh, connections, asteroid connections of this particular family. So we have a few minutes left. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, yes, Maurice again. You were referring to the asteroid of one's person name, like Angelina's, the asteroid Angelina falling yes. in her third house but not making any significant aspect. Yeah. Can you say that that house becomes a house where some kind of destiny or self-actualization? Perhaps one could say that. Did you find personally in your research any particular significance to the, the asteroid of one's name in one's chart's placement? I haven't looked at it that way, but that would be a very fruitful area of research and in what area of life, one could say, signified by the house, would your name have its fullest expression? Uh, Julie. Um, I'm wondering if you notice the same incredible, you know, it's just so <laughs> obvious here, um, in the charts of famous people, and often just using regular astrology, people mm -hmm. who are well known in the public, you know, they seem to fit the archetypes really mm -hmm. well. Do you notice the same thing in just doing charts for clients who aren't well known, oh, that absolutely. it's just this powerful too? Absolutely. Well, you, you. Okay. You could like talk to some of the people who I've done readings here for today and ask them if the asteroids speak to them. It's strongly, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Passed around, has not gotten, you know, everywhere okay. and it probably Good. won't. Whoever has that list, keep it moving. I'll, we'll leave it out at the back table for the rest of the day yeah. so that you can refer to it. And then also whoever didn't sign my email list, that list is on the back table as well. And could you repeat then where we could have access to the listing, where we could could uh, manipulate it to um, the alphabetical list or to the category? Mark Pottinger's CCRS program. Thank you. So if you put Mark Pottinger CCRS in the Google search, Not you can get to him. Pardon me? Pottinger, P-O-T-T-E-N-G-E-R. Okay, so I hope um, for all of the people in um, evolutionary astrology, who are very interested in past lives and reincarnation and the motifs of the soul's fate and destiny, the asteroids provide an incredible window to be able to look at those um, questions in a very detailed and specific way. Uh, yes, Kim Marie. Am I on? Am I on? Um, 
Demetra was kind enough to gift me my asteroid list the, um, when she came here. And uh, those of you know my husband as Leroy. Well, when I met Leroy, he was a Lee. And to me, he's always been a Lee. Lee conjuncts my sun, Mercury, and Neptune. <laughs> okay, so there's your answer, Julie. <laughs> okay, well, the very last thing I want to say is that in the Sabian symbols, the symbol for my son is an epidemic of mumps. And it means the infectious spread of an individual disease throughout the collective. <laughs> so really what I've been doing this last hour is inoculating you all with a good dose of asteroid madness. <laughs>